to you all and welcoming you. We have a few more minutes before worship begins. However, it's a nice time to at least be able to see each other.
Okay. Um, okay. Um, hi, everybody. You are all unmuted, and I'm going to invite you all to say hello to each other. Hi. Hi. Good morning. Good morning. Hi. Feel free to wave. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Okay. I'm all right. Good. Now I'm going to meet you all again. Okay. Now, now I'm now I'm on. So. Okay. You should all be muted. Hi. And now we are going to center ourselves by starting with a piano performance uh, played by Sue Titus Reed. This is one of her favorite gospel songs and which she shared with us. Let's just see what we what's all around. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> I see some applause happening. <laughs> All right. Now that we have had that moment of music to center ourselves, I just want to acknowledge those who have contributed to this worship experience. Uh, Sue Titus Reed for the music that she shared with us. We have a guest lay reader today, and that's Autumn Moran, who will be reading scripture for us. We have had Billy Le um, Carlton and Alan Labrie prepared music with the choir for us, and Alan has done some more composition. So again, we, as ever, we have so many gifts being offered to our community, and Chris, of course, is in the background helping make all of this possible. So for the many offerings, over time of music and time and experience, we appreciate your presence among us and the ways that you help us gather for worship creatively. I would like to move us now to prayers of the people. Uh, I'm going to ask that you either type your prayer in the chat if you want me to see it or unmute yourselves one at a time to share, uh, we did this at the eight o'clock service and we're gonna try it again today in a very brief format. What are your wines or your shines about what is happening in your world right now? Very brief, like one or two words, a wine and a shine. So you know how to unmute yourselves either with your space bar or star six if you're on the phone um, or type it in the chat box if you can't reach me otherwise. Anybody have a, sh a wine or a shine they want to share this morning? Reverend Gail? Kevin? I'll try and keep it brief. Uh, prayer for Reverend Gail, Pastor Nathan, the, the police, the firemen, the EMTs, the grocery workers, and the um, pharmacists, and also for the Ipswich Youth Group, and um, my friend Gail is sick. Those are prayers. Okay, thank you, Kevin. 
Anybody have any wines or shines, things that you want to complain about really quickly and things that you're grateful for? Remember to I'm unmute. Great. Go ahead. I'm grateful for the most beautiful day that we had yesterday and sharing with friends. It was beautiful and look forward to being with everyone soon. Thank you, Sue. Hey, Gail, it's Bob. Uh, I haven't uh, had any updates recently, and she's been on my mind a lot from uh, your daughter, Sarah. I hope she's safe. Uh, thank you, Sarah, and others like her who are on the front lines medically, and we, many of us have family members, um, you know, Meg's daughters out there in the pharmacy being exposed all the time, but Sarah's well, thank you for asking. Uh, I have posted here um, to rem a reminder that my niece, Alexis Wobbin, had emergency hip surgery. She's a preteen, and um, she, they had to do a COVID test, and then she underwent a very successful hip surgery yesterday at Children's Hospital in Columbus, Ohio, and she's going to be on crutches for three months, so prayers for her, and uh, shine for those who knew just what to do. And then I see from Sasha, blessings to her daughter-in-law, who is working on the front lines in a hospital in Virginia Hospital, in a Virginia hospital. So uh, both wine and shine right there from Sasha, right? People that have to be at risk and people that do so willingly and we pray for their ongoing safety. Other wines and shines. Uh, shine to the bouncy baby boy. Thank you for announcing last week. I did see it uh, on the tape after. Thank you. And hit, say his name again, please, Claire. His name is John. Uh, unmute yourself, Claire. His, his name? I, am I unmuted? Yes. Ellis Jonathan Hill. Ellis oh. after the river. All right, Ellis Jonathan Hill. So a shine for the arrival in the world of Ellis, and Ellis Jonathan Hill. Other wines and shines. Gail, I also have a shine. Okay. Um, I'm grateful for my job. I'm grateful for the birds coming out and the buds on the trees. And I'm grateful to you, Reverend Gail, for saving my life. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll say that God, in all the ways that God shows up in your life, Kevin, is saving your life. <laughs> all right. Other wines and shines? I want to make sure I'm not missing anybody. If you're on a phone, I'm going to invite you to go ahead and share now by unmuting yourself uh, because I don't have a, a way to see you raise your hand. All right, then I'm going to consider that we have lifted up in prayer those immediate wines and shines that weren't already shared at an eight o'clock service or in some other way. Did I miss anybody? Can you so. hear me, Ms. Arden? Yes, Arden. Okay. Um, I just wanted to say I was very grateful that Allison is improving, our daughter Allison mm -hmm. uh, is improving. Um, I had a long conversation with her. That is the first time I have been able to talk to her because she's now able to hear on the phone with some uh, special um, ear things that she's gotten. And I also just wanna say that I'm grateful for yesterday because I got a lot of leaves gone from the immediate area, but I'm probably the only one happy that it's gonna snow again. <laughs> That might be true, Arden. <laughs> so wine and shine from Arden for the voice of her daughter and her, well, her daughter's ability to hear her and talk to her on the phone. Her daughter had a brain aneurysm or hemorrhage and then was in a coma and is recovering from that. Um, we lift up Barry Brodel and Jan Brodel who continue to have changes in their lives as he lives with um, paralysis from the chest down due to the spinal injury from his skiing accident. And he's coming home from rehab on May 6th and they are moving permanently down to Plymouth, Mass. 
um, and their lives are always transformed. So for all that that means for them. Um, all those living with cancer. And we think especially of very hard hit parts, either of our own country, but also nations that don't even have the uh, cushion, the buffer of resources that we do. And I think about Honduras and I think of Zimbabwe. Um, some of those areas are actually facing starvation or they're eating their seed corn and their seed crops now, which means that if they don't face starvation right now, they aren't going to have food in the, the next season or something will have to change. So we pray for the survival of people right now, uh, both through the disease and through all of its complexities. And then we pray for a, a response that is sustainable for all communities, not just our own, not just our valley, not just our nation, but everywhere. And now I'm going to move us into prayer. Oh, holy God, you are the presence who walks with us in the between times, between the death and the resurrection, between the ending of the world as we once knew it and the beginning of a world that is remade. We ask that you will remake us in your image in all the ways that you would hope for us to be to each other, love, and justice and hope and resilience and a healing presence. We ask that you will allow this energy to flow out into the worlds from the top down and the bottom up into all the lives and the communities and the places that so need your touch and your presence. You have heard our whines, you have heard our shines, you see before you gathered here your faithful people and there are people all over this world who are your children you see all of us. We offer you now our silence and our prayers in that silence. And we ask that you will hear us as we pray together that prayer that you first taught us saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now we are going to have an offering by Autumn Buran, who will be reading the scripture for us today. We will be putting the images up on the screen so you can all follow along. And um, we'll just make sure that Autumn is unmuted. That you, Chris has already taken care of that. But Autumn, if you're ready, will you just tell me that Say yes. Oh, you're not unmuted yet. Let me do that. There we go. Okay, Autumn, I can hear you now. So when you're ready to go, you start. John 20, 19 to 29. Jesus appears to the disciples. When it was evening on the day, which they opened up, the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked with the Jews. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace with you, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he, when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive of the Holy Spirit, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are redeemed. Jesus and Thomas. Oh, yes. Um, but Thomas, who is called the twin, oh, but Thomas, who is called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when he came. The other disciples told him, "We have seen the Lord." And he said to them, "Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails, and my hand in the side, I will not believe." A week later, the disciples were again in the house. 
and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hand. Reach out to put your hand in my side. Do not doubt or believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen it and yet have to come believe. And I thank you. I thank you, Autumn. I've muted the Varian family again, but thank you so much for sharing and by reading. Um, we, we, we want to make sure that this church is well aware that we have an up and coming generation of young leaders and they have been offering their gifts in so many different ways through music, through singing and through reading the word to us. Um, I think even Nora has volunteered. She might do it at some point. We'll see. But uh, that was a big reading, and thank you, Autumn, for sharing it. I would ask you now to uh, pray with me, please. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So you'll notice that in the reading that Autumn shared with us, there are two scenes. And one of them is when the followers of Christ are gathered in a room by themselves together. And their friend Thomas is not among them. And I think we've already made the parallel in past weeks that this is not unlike the quarantine that we find ourselves in right now. That these followers have removed themselves from the public eye. They are sheltering in place. They are trying to remain safe, avoid co continued violence, the attention of the oppressive authorities, and they may be doing emergency management planning as well, right there in that room together. Thomas, on the other hand, is somewhere out on the front lines doing some kind of an essential job. He's not with them the first time that Christ makes Christ's appearance, but he's there the second time, and in between we have this period of uncertainty and disbelief because Thomas cannot possibly make sense of this idea that Christ has appeared to his brethren and told them that they will inherit his work and that he has breathed upon them and given them the right to forgive others. He has commissioned them to go out and be his hands and feet of love in the world. Thomas says, I, I'm not going to believe it unless I can see it for myself. If I can touch it with my hand, then maybe, maybe. Uh, he's a skeptic. He's a truth seeker. Uh, but he does not lack in courage. And it is the kind of courage that Thomas has to ask for truth that we sometimes need in times like these. And I'm going to pause us there in the story from the scripture and turn us to the story of an artist. This is one of my favorite artists. Um, he's a religious artist. I, I'm showing you right now an image that he came across as a young man. The image you see is an image painted by Raphael, who is um, an Italian Renaissance painter. And this is from the 16th century. But the young man who saw it is from our century and from the 20th century. He was a young man in China. His name is Huchi. And he had been born shortly before the um, Cultural Revolution in China under the regime of Mao Zedong. And he had some training in art. But he, his father was a mathematics professor in the Nanking University, and which had been shut down. There were no classes running because they weren't continue, considered to be of value. They were trying to eradicate all um, remnants of Western culture, capitalism as an economic thought, any sort of religious influence, any sort of cultural influence that the West might still have, they were trying to remove those vestiges and that included a lot of education. So not unlike us, the schools were shut down, but unlike us, there was no chance for any kind of learning to happen. Instead, this young man was sent out into the fields to do manual labor, 
like so many other millions of people at that time, um, subsistence farming to feed others with no chance of learning or any type of future. And Hu Qi resisted that future for himself. He sought to find a way out of the fields. And when their nation replaced any kind of spiritual influence, they created icons of Mao Zedong, right? He became the one that people venerated. And so if you painted portraits of Mao Zedong, you could spend your time working on art instead of working in the fields. And so here's a young man who has found a way out of the fields and he's painting portraits of a dictator who has forced him away from university and school and a chance to learn and connect with others. And somewhere along the lines, he came across this image that I'm sharing with all of you. For those that are on the phone, this is Raphael's Madonna. And she's cradling a very chubby baby Jesus and her head is leaning gently into him. And there's maybe just the hint of a very gentle smile on her face. And Hu Qi had faced so many struggles and he won't even recount them now to people about some of the things that he saw and experienced. But he was seeking peace. And in her smile, he saw peace. And so he began painting at night. He kept trying to recreate that image of the Madonna painted by Raphael. And somewhere along the line, this 16th century Italian Renaissance painter had reached across continents and centuries and offered peace embodied in a mother and a child to a struggling young teenager in another oppressive environment. Now Hu Qi went on to become a different kind of painter and we'll talk more about his art shortly, but I want to walk you through a few other images that artists have shown us across time and how they saw Christ in themselves and in their context. And we'll start with this image of Christ entering the room where the men were sheltering in place. This is an image from the Duccio di Buonasegna, which is a monastery. It was probably painted in the 1460s. And you can see that it has, it, for those that can see, view it, it's, it's a very stylized, iconic kind of image. They have golden halos around their heads and then they're very stiff positions. But Jesus is reaching out to the men and it's the first time that he's seeing them. And you can see even in this image that they're afraid. They're sort of reaching out, but they're alarmed. And twice he says to them, be not afraid. He's trying to calm them down so that he can allow them to experience his presence with what Hu Qi was seeking, peace. Peace be with you. This is what Hu Qi was needing. But the first people to need it after those terrible events were those that loved Christ most. And who doesn't need peace even now in these times? We are still asking for that message of peace within ourselves and peace in our world so that we can indeed be love and hope to each other. And then in the next image, which comes from the same monastery, you'll see that we come to that second scene that Autumn read for us, where Thomas said, I, there's no way. I'm not going to believe this until I see it for myself. And in the second appearance that Christ made in that same room, indeed, Thomas was there. He was home from his essential job out in the world. And Christ invited him to touch for himself. Now, there's a gap here in the scripture. Artists have interpreted, and even many preachers have interpreted, that indeed Thomas reached out with his hand and touched the wounds of Christ. And we can see in the next image by Caravaggio how real this idea becomes, how very sensory. This is, uh, you know, a master at his work, at his craft. He's a Baroque painter. And this was painted in around the 1600s in Italy. And you can almost imagine yourself 
in that scene, there's a guy with a, a, a tear on the seam of his shoulder and he's got his hand right in there, right? I, and I'm not gonna believe it till I touch it for myself. He is an absolute skeptic and he's looking for the truth. And then what's so profound about this painting is that, right, Caravaggio is trying to bring Christ to us, to help us place ourselves in this scene and feel maybe perhaps what his followers would also have felt, including the disbelief or the uncertainty and the need to, to be connected in real ways to this truth. But we are still longing for that in this century. And so this next painting, which you're going to see, is a clearly, it's a 21st century version of Caravaggio. We have the same painting with the same light and dark. And there's three young, well, there's two young men and perhaps a young woman gathered around the figure of Christ. And this time, the skeptic in the front of us is in a black leather jacket. He's got glasses, and he could be anybody's young professor or a college student friend. He's a young person who just really doesn't believe until he gets to touch. And then we'll see again in the next painting, also inspired by Caravaggio. This is by a Haitian American named Alex Bojour. And again, Alex takes Caravaggio's work and he shows us Christ in the way that Alex might experience Christ with men of color and a Christ of color who reflects God back to him and him, God in himself, right? There's this reciprocity of their connection to each other. And through all of these, we have people that are trying to see in a new and a different way, which is certainly something that is happening to us right now. We are, we are being challenged to change how we look at the world. And now I wanna take you back to Hu Chi. Hu Chi, who had moved himself out of the fields and was at night painting these portraits of the Madonna, while by day he was painting portraits of Mao Zedong and he'd won a competition. Now, some of the influences that Hu Chi had around him included Buddhist iconography, you'll see that here. And they included folk paintings. Um, the next image will show you uh, a very colorful fabric textile that um, might have been in his surroundings. And the next uh, image that I'm going to show you shows you the, the varying influences that he began to collect because Hu Chi indeed was allowed to leave China to study in Germany and he studied what you can see on the right in this image is again a uh, it's actually an illuminated painting from a Psalter in St. Albans and it's again an image of St. Thomas but you can see again the, the golden halo around the head. You can see the very stylized characters. They are all standing sideways. If you could picture like an Egyptian painting with people flat and sideways, uh, reaching out towards Christ and touching him. How, how very different that is from the Caravaggio. It's, it's not lifelike, it's very flat and stylized. And then on the left, you can see this other image again of folk paintings that were happening in his own country right now. These aren't antique, these are contemporary paintings by folk artists. And what Hu Chi was attempting to do, and what you're going to see in the next image, which is the image of Doubting Thomas as painted by Hu Chi, is that he combined these different um, influences. He, he moved from that gentle smile of the Madonna by Raphael to combining some of the influences of European artwork, specifically from the Middle Ages and also contemporary artists, but also Chinese influence. And what he was sharing was his own connection to Christ, that Christ had reached across centuries and continents to him in the smile of a mother and the gentle presence of a baby to give him peace when his life was not peaceful. And he has committed himself to offering peace to those that he teaches. He's an artist and a, an artist in residence at multiple universities. He went back to Nanjing and he received his doctorate in religious art. He was the first in China to do so as the opening of that country began and the reconnection to multiple cultures occurred. And 
he wanted to bring his own people into the art that he created and he wanted to share an image of God that they could relate to, not a white European God or an African-American God, but a God that his people saw because he believed that God saw him and he wanted his people to see the God that he knew, the God that gave him peace and hope and courage to resist oppression, to seek education and empowerment and to create a life that was sustainable for himself and later for his wife and his son who has the privilege of also studying the capacity for mobility to speak out. He doesn't talk much about his early years and he says his focus is to bring peace. And I offer you now this final image. This is the image of Christ as painted by Huchi, the risen Christ, the Christ of all people who reaches across all continents, all time periods, all languages, all divides. This is the final image that I leave you with, and, and I'm going to bring you back into the view of each other as we conclude this morning's thoughts together to say that this is the God for all of us. If you reach up your hand, you can try to touch other people, right? You can reach out to other people. There are so many ways to be connected. And the promise of God is that we don't have to dwell inside the oppression and the tribulations and the trials that we have been experiencing, but we can hold on to that message of peace and what peace means. And peace is a tenacious muscular word, just like love, to bring peace into places where there is not peace, including our own hearts, our own harm, our own homes, our own communities, our nation, and this whole world is to reach out to each other and to believe that there should be justice and equity and sustainability for all people. To see that not just the people here in this small gathering, but people in China and in Zimbabwe and Honduras are people who are also children of God and they need the same peace that we are offering to each other. The greatest shine and hope that I heard today was the presence of friends and neighbors who were reaching out when they were outside walking or gardening or doing errands for each other. We are loving each other in amazing ways and that is our hope and that is the hope that we are challenged to carry with us into this new future and this changed reality that we are experiencing. Thomas's great courage earlier in John was to say that he would follow Christ even to death and to encourage his friends to go where risk was, to stay together with the one that they loved and to follow him wherever he took them. And yes, he was a skeptic because he needed truth. But when he was in the presence of a love that came back beyond death itself to be with him and to knit his community back together and to say, it's your turn. You are the one that bears love and peace within you. And I ask you to take this peace that I have offered you and carry it out into the world as a true, a living gift to others. He didn't back away. He was the first and only person in all of the gospels to say, my Lord and my God, to name the one that he followed as the one that he loved the one that he would lean on through everything and to take up that challenge and to go out into the world and to love others the way that he had been loved, the way he had been led, and to do it not alone, but to do it in the community of other children of God, knowing that wherever he went, he would find other children of God all around him. And to them, he would bring peace. And indeed, that peace has been passed down from that first quiet locked room across the centuries, placed in illuminated books, painted on the walls of monasteries, in the paintings of great masters, showing up on a magazine color for a frightened boy in China during an oppressive regime, and coming to life under his brush to reach back across continents as a message of peace to us today.
In the words of Christ, peace be with you. Thanks be to God. And friends, as ever, I remind you that indeed peace comes in many forms and we are creating responses to our own local community and international crises even now. And so the ongoing generosity and support that you offer to us helps us remain vital partners here in the Valley and with those communities to whom we are committed. We are sending emergency funds to Zimbabwe. We will probably be allocating emergency funds to Honduras and we are allocating emergency response funds here in the Valley for things like food insecurity at this time. We are love and we are peace walking in the world. And I ask that you will either continue your weekly habit, your practice of placing an offering in a little vase right there in the room or go to jxncc.org and do what you are able to do to help us remain a loving and vital presence in all the places where God needs us to be. And now we get to have some fun together. Our choir sang for us this week and created leadership for the song, Be Thou My Vision. I'm sure you can make the connection between Thomas wanting to see for himself and this song that asks God to help us change our perception and to continue to be love in the world. Please sing along. <laughs> favorite we're going to sing our benediction together and so those words will now go up on the screen for everybody and then you can hang out and you can listen to a little bit of Alan's ongoing compositions followed by a chance to wave at each other and actually chat across the screen in zoom <laughs>
So we will um, conclude this morning's service by saying go in peace. Feel free to remain and listen to Alan's composition. And then in about 30 seconds, we'll unmute all of you and you can chat.